Hi guys, today we are going to read, um, start with chapter 18 on James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl. Um, this is for my um, third through fifth graders, but certainly any student in um, our school can enjoy the story if they want. Um, when we left off, they were found out they were, they didn't know where they were. We knew that they had landed in the ocean. They think that they are at the promised land and they are just getting ready to um, tunnel. They tunneled up and ready to come out at the top of the peach to see where they are. Chapter 18. A minute later, they were at the top of the opening, standing at the very top of the peach near the stem, blinking their eyes at the strong sunlight and peering nervously around. What happened? Where are we? This is impossible, unbelievable, terrible. I told you we were bobbing up and down, the ladybug said. In the midst of the sea, cried James, and indeed they were. A strong current and a high wind had carried the peach so quickly away from the shore that already the land was out of sight. All around them lay the vast black ocean, deep and hungry. Little waves were bibbling against the side of the peach. But how did it happen, they cried. Where are the fields? Where are the woods? Where is England? Nobody, not even James, could understand how in the world a thing like this could have come about. Ladies and gentlemen, the old green grasshopper said, trying very hard to keep the fear and disappointment out of his voice. I'm afraid that we find ourselves in a rather awkward situation. Awkward, cried the earthworm, my dear old green grasshopper. We are finished. Every one of us is about to peril, perish. I may be blind, you know, but that much I can see clearly. Off with my boots, cried the centipede. I cannot swim with my boots on. I cannot swim at all, cried the ladybug. Nor can I, wailed the glowworm. Nor can I, said the spider. None of us three girls can swim a single stroke. But you won't have to swim, James said calmly. We're floating beautifully, and sooner or later a ship is bound to come along and pick us up. They all stared at him in amazement. Are you quite sure that we are not sinking, the ladybug asked. Of course I'm sure, answered James. Go and look for yourselves. They all ran over to the side of the peach and they peered down at the water below. The boy is right, said the old green grasshopper. We are floating beautifully. Now we all must just sit and keep perfectly calm. Everything will be all right in the end. The what absolute nonsense, cried the earthworm. Nothing is ever going to be all right in the end and you well know it. Poor earthworm, said the ladybug, whispering in James's ear. He loves to make everything into a disaster. He hates to be happy. He is only happy when he is gloomy. And now that isn't, isn't that odd. But then I suppose just being an earthworm is enough to make a person pretty gloomy. Wouldn't you agree? If this peach is not going to sink, the earthworm was saying. And if we are not going to be drowned, then every one of you is going to starve to death instead. Do you realize that we haven't got a single thing to eat since yesterday morning? By golly, he's right, cried the centipede. For once, the earthworm is right. Of course I'm right, the old earthworm said. And we're not likely to find anything around here either. We shall get thinner and thinner and thirstier and thirstier, and we shall all die a slow and grisly death from starving. I am dying already. I am slowly shivering up for want for food. Personally, I would rather drown. But good heavens, you must be blind, said James. You know very well that I'm blind, snapped the earthworm. There is no need to rub it in. I didn't mean that, said James quickly. I'm sorry, but can't you see that? See, shouted the poor earthworm. How can I see if I am blind? James took a deep, slow breath. Can't you realize, he said patiently, that we have enough food here to last us for weeks and weeks? Where, they all said, where? Well, why, the peach, of course. Our whole ship is made of food. My dear James, said the old green grasshopper, laying a front leg affectionately on James's shoulder. I don't know what we would do without you. You are so clever. Ladies and gentlemen, we are saved again. We are most certainly not, said the earthworm. You must be crazy. We can't eat the ship. It's the only thing that's keeping us up. Well, we shall starve if we don't, said the centipede. And we shall drown if we do, cried the earthworm. Oh dear, oh dear, said the old green grasshopper. Now we're worse off than before. Well, couldn't we eat just a little bit of it, Miss Spider said. I'm so dreadfully hungry. You're going to eat all you want, James answered. It would take us weeks and weeks to get any sort of dent in this enormous peach. Surely you can see that. Good heavens, he's right again, called the old green grasshopper, clapping his hands. It would take weeks and weeks. Of course it would. But let's not make a lot of holes all over the deck. I think we better simply scoop out from the tunnel over there, the one we've just come up. 
That's an excellent idea, said the ladybug. What are you looking so worried about, said the earthworm. What are you looking so worried about, earthworm, said the centipede. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, the earthworm said, the problem is, well, the problem is that there is no problem. Everybody burst out laughing. Cheer up, earthworm, they said. Come and eat. And they all went over to the tunnel entrance, and they began scooping out great chunks of juicy golden peach flesh. Ah, oh, marvelous, said the centipede, stuffing it into his mouth. Delicious, said the old green grasshopper. Just fabulous, said the glowworm. Oh, my, said the ladybug primly. What a heavenly taste. She looked up at James, and then she smiled at James, and James smiled back at her. They sat down on the deck together, both of them chewing away happily. You know, James, said the ladybug, up until this moment, I've never in my life tasted anything except those tiny little green flies that live on rose bushes. They have a perfectly delightful flavor, but this peach is much better. Isn't it glorious, said Miss Sp Spider, coming over to join them. Personally, I had always thought that a big juice caught, juicy caught in the web blue bottle, blue bottle was the finest dinner in the world until I tasted this. What a flavor, the centipede cried. It's terrific. There is nothing like it. I have never, ever, ever tasted anything so yummy. And I should know, because I personally have tasted all the finest foods in the world. Whereupon centipede, with his mouth full of peach and the juice running down all over his chin, suddenly burst into song. I've eaten many strange and scrumptious dishes in my time, like jellied gnats, and dandy prats, and earwigs cooked in slime, and mice with rice, they're really nice, when roasted in their prime. But don't forget to sprinkle them with just a pinch of grime. I've eaten fresh mud burgers by the greatest cooks there are, and scrambled dregs and stink bug eggs, and hornets stewed in tar, and pails of snails and lizard tails, and beetles by the jar. A beetle is improved just by a splash of vinegar. I often eat boiled slobbages. They're grand when served beside. Minced doodle bugs and curried slugs. And have you ever tried? Mosquitoes, toes, and womp fish rows. And de most delicately fried. The only trouble is they disagree with my inside. I'm made for crispy wasp stings on a piece of buttered toast. And pickled spines of porcupines. And then a gorgeous roast of dragon's flesh. Well hung, not fresh. It costs a buck at most and comes to you in barrels if you order by the post. I crave the tasty tentacles of octopi for tea. I like hot dogs, I love hot frogs, and surely you'll agree. A plate of soil with engine's oil is a super recipe. I hardly need to mention that it's practically free. For dinner on my birthday, shall I tell you what I chose? Hot noodles made from poodles on a slice of garden hose, and rather smelly jelly and an armadillo's toe, toes. The jelly is delicious, but you have to hold your nose. Now comes the cent now comes the centipede declared the burden of my speech. These folds are rare beyond compare. Foods these foods are rare beyond compare. Some are right out of reach, but there's no doubt I'd go without a million plates of each. For one small mite, a tiny bite of this fantastic peach. Everybody was feeling happy now. The sun was shining brightly out of the, la the soft blue sky and the day was calm. The giant peach with its sunlight glinting on its side was like a massive golden ball sailing on a silver sea. Look, cried the centipede just as they were finishing their meal. Look at that funny thin black thing gliding through the water over there. They all swung to look. There were two of them, said Miss Spider. There are lots of them, said Ladybug. There must be some kind of fish, said the old green grasshopper. Perhaps they have come to say hello. They are sharks, cried Earthworm. I'll bet you anything like that, that they are sharks and they have come along to eat us up. What? Absolutely not, said Centipede, but his voice seemed suddenly to have become a little shaky and he wasn't laughing. I am positive they are sharks, said Earthworm. I know they are sharks. And so in actual fact did everyone else, but they were too frightened to admit it. There was a short silence, and they peered down anxiously at the sharks who were cruising slowly round and round the beach. Just assuming that they are sharks, the centipede said, there still can't possibly be any danger if we stay up here. But even as he spoke, one of those thin black fins suddenly changed direction and came cutting swiftly through the water right up to the side of the peach itself. The shark paused and stared up at the company with his small, evil eyes. Go away, they shouted. Go away, you filthy beast. Slowly, almost lazily, the shark opened his mouth, which was big enough to have swallowed a perambular, and made a lunge at the peach. 
They all watched in a gasp, and now, as though as a signal from a leader, all the other sharks came swimming toward the beach, and they clustered around it, and they began to attack it furiously. There must have been twenty or thirty of them, at least, all pushing and fighting and lashing their tails, turning up the water into a froth. Panic and pandemonium broke out immediately on top of the beach. Oh, we are finished now, cried Miss Spider, wringing her feet. They will eat up the whole peach, and then there will be nothing left for us to stand on, and then they'll start on us. She's right, shouted the ladybug. We are lost forever. Oh, I don't want to be eaten, wailed the earthworm, but will they take me first of all because I'm so fat and juicy and I have no bones? Is there nothing we can do? asked the ladybug, appealing to James. Surely you can think of a way out of this. Suddenly they were all looking at James. Think, began Miss Ladybug. Think, James, think. Come on, said Centipede. Come on, James. There must be something we can do. Their eyes all waited upon him, tense, anxious, empathetic, but hopeful. There is something I believe we might try, James Henry Trotter said slowly. I'm not saying it will work. Try us, said the earthworm. Tell us quick. Well, we'll try anything you say, said the centipede, but hurry, hurry, hurry. Be quiet and let the boy speak, said the ladybug. Go on, James. They all moved a little closer to him. There was a longish pause. Go on, they cried frantically. Go on. And all the while they were waiting, they could hear the sharks threshing around in the water below them. It was enough to make anyone frantic. Come on, James, said the ladybug, coaxing him. I, I, I'm afraid it's no good after all, James murmured, shaking his head. I'm terribly sorry, I forgot. We don't have any string. We need hundreds of yards of string to make this work. What sort of string, asked the old green grasshopper sharply. Well, any sort, just so it's long and strong. But my dear boy, that's exactly what we do have. We've got all you want. How? Where? Well, the silkworm, cried the old green grasshopper. Didn't you ever notice the silkworm? She's still downstairs. She never moves. She just lies there sleeping all day. We can easily wake her up and make her spin. And what about me, may I ask, said Miss Spider. I can spin just as well as any silkworm. What's more, I can spin patterns. Can you make enough between you, asked James, as much as you want. And quickly? Of course, of course. And would it be strong? The strongest there is. It's as thick as your finger, but why? What are you going to do? I'm going to lift this peach clear up out of the water, James announced firmly. You're mad, cried Earthworm. It's our only chance. The boy is crazy. He's joking. Go on, James, the ladybug said gently. How are you going to do it? Sky hooks, I suppose, jeered Centipede. Seagulls, James answered calmly. The place is full of them. Look up there. They all looked up and they saw a great mass of seagulls wheeling around and around in the sky. I'm going to make a long silk string, James went on, and I'm going to loop one end of it around the seagull's neck. And then I'm going to tie another end to the stem of the peach. He pointed to the peach stem, which was standing up like a short, thick mast in the middle of the deck. And then I'm going to get another seagull and do the same thing. And then another and another. Ridiculous, they shouted. Absurd. Poppycock. Balderdash. Madness. And the old green grasshopper said, how could a few seagulls lift up an enormous thing like this into the air? And all of us as well. It would take hundreds, thousands. Well, there is no shortage of seagulls, James answered. Look for yourself. We'll probably need 400, 500, 600, maybe even 1,000. I don't know. I shall simply have to go on hooking them up onto the stem until we have enough to lift us. They'll be bound to lift us in the end. It's like balloons. You can give someone enough balloons to hold, I mean really enough, and then he goes up. And a seagull has far more lifting power than a balloon. If only we had the time to do it. If only we were not sunk first by those awful sharks. You're absolutely off your head, said the earthworm. How on earth do you propose to get a loop of string around a seagull's neck? I suppose you're going to fly up there yourself and catch it. The boy is dotty, said the centipede. Let him finish, said the ladybug. Go on, James. How would you do it? With bait. Bait? What sort of bait? Well, with a worm, of course. Seagulls love worms. Didn't you know that? And lucky for us, we have here the biggest, fattest, pinkest, juiciest earthworm in the whole world. You can stop right there, the earthworm said sharply. That is enough. Go on, said the others, beginning to grow interested. Go on. The seagulls have already spotted him, James continued. That's why there are so many of them circling around. But they don't dare come close to him while the rest of us are all standing here. So this is what stop cried the earthworm. Stop, 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 stop. I will not do it. I refuse. I, I, I. Be quiet, said Centipede. Mind your own business. I like that. My dear earthworm, you're going to get eaten anyway, so what difference does it make if it's by sharks or seagulls? I won't do it. Why don't we want to hear what the plan is first, said the old green grasshopper. I don't give a hoot what the plan is, cried the earthworm. I am not going to be pecked to death by a bunch of seagulls. You'll be a martyr, said the centipede. I shall respect you for the rest of my life. 
So will I, said Miss Spider, and your name will be in all the newspaper. Earthworm gives life to save friends. They won't have to give us life, James told them. Now listen to me. This is what we'll do. That's where we're going to stop today. A cliffhanger. We'll have to find out what they do and if it works when um, we come back and read some more tomorrow. We'll start on chapter 21 of James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl.